this is a uh, talk by uh, next talk comes from from Moscow actually Daniela Kolesov works at the Shemyakin of Chinikov Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry uh, in the laboratory of genetically encoded molecular tools. Yeah, he will talk about his research into using insect chemo receptor, uh, insect chemo receptors to control activity in mammalian cells. So that's a very different perspective on insect taste and smell. Uh, go ahead, Daniela. Uh, first, I should shortly characterize the focus of my presentation. Uh, it's about chemogenetics. Uh, chemogenetics is a group of techniques for controlling uh, electrical activity of neurons. Uh, in mammalian chemogenetics, uh, two main players are DREF, GPCR family, and the PSAM, uh, belongs to ligand gated ion channels. Also, uh, their mechanism of action is different, uh, but they have several similarities. Uh, they are based on uh, mammalian endogenous receptors created by protein engineering. Uh, endogenous ligands do not activate those receptors, uh, and their ligands are pharmacology inert. Uh, the evolution of these methods has been aimed at uh, increasing the specificity for their synthetic ligand. Uh, however, the disadvantage of these techniques uh, is that they cannot be used to independently control several subpopulation of neurons in one experiment uh, because there is only one specific ligand uh, for whole receptor uh, family. Uh, we addressed uh, this issue using insect chemoreceptors. They are orthogonal for mammalian cells. Some of their ligands are not normally found uh, uh, are not normally found in mammalian tissues. Uh, they have large variety of ligands and process uh, high specificity. In this study, we took chemoreceptors from three different families, odorant receptors, ionotropic receptors, and gustatory receptors, uh, and tried them with heterologous expression in mammalian uh, electrically excitable uh, cells. Uh, the first group of receptors uh, with which we started working are the odorant receptors. Uh, earlier studies have already expressed receptors of this family in uh, HEC uh, 293T. Uh, in our study, all for possible variants uh, was successfully expressed in HEC cells and functionally tested. Uh, they all respond to the correct ligands. Uh, and next, we switched to testing in uh, primary. Uh, neurons. Uh, we attempt to express force in both primary neurons and fresh tissue brain uh, sections. However, uh, the expression of these receptors in mammalian neuron cell uh, led to death. Uh, we suppose that strong cytotoxic cytotoxicity is connected to leaky calcium current. Uh, so we didn't have the opportunity uh, to chemical stimulation neurons. Uh, the next group of receptors is ionotropic receptors. Uh, most are composed uh, of four subunit types uh, that, compl that complicated their mammalian expression, but some works uh, as uh, heterodimers. Uh, we took such receptors, all three pair of receptors uh, were successfully expressed in uh, mouse neurons. In contrast to other receptors, the expression of this group of receptors did not, uh, did not uh, lead to the death of mammalian neurons. Uh, at the moment, functional testing was carried out only for uh, IR64A, IR8A uh, uh, pair, derived uh, acid sensitive. Uh, we have shown that primary neurons expressed uh, this pair uh, of anthropic receptors uh, generate an action potential uh, in response to acetic acid. Uh, however, control neurons uh, also generate an action potential to response to ligand stimulation. Uh, apparently, this is due to the presence of their endogenous acid sensitive receptors in neurons. Uh, 
uh, the third group of receptors is regustatory receptors. Uh, we have selected three receptors of the DMGR43 like clad. They are BMGR9, BMGR10, and TCGR20. This ligand defructose, phenazitol, and manitol, uh, respectively. Uh, DMGR43-like clad differs uh, in that the receptors of this family are homomers and ligand-gated ion channels. Uh, the first thing uh, we did was uh, express uh, these receptors in HEC 293T cells, then for functional testing, uh, then for fu functional testing, uh, we expressed them in neurons uh, and measured the potential change uh, this uh, current clamp method. Uh, we also looked at change on uh, calcium concentration in uh, cardiomyocytes uh, with help of calcium imaging. Uh, using calcium imaging in primary mouse neurons, we have certain fields uh, in the fluorescence of uh, GCAM calcium sensor uh, in response uh, to the addition of the corresponding ligand. As you can see, all receptors respond uh, to a strictly specific ligand for BMGR9 is a fructose, for BMGR10 is a myoinositol, for TCGR20 is a manitol. Uh, and uh, not response uh, to the rest. Uh, after that, we move from the reproduce to this result in current clamp mode. Uh, then applied with the appropriate ligand, uh, mouse neuron generated an action potential uh, while cross functions and counter counters without receptors uh, were not generated. Uh, as you can see, we can change stimulation strength uh, by uh, change, changing application time. Uh, and also the response amplitude was concentration dependent. Uh, previously, it was shown that uh, glucose can inhibit GR9 function. Uh, since glucose is presented in all types of cultural media, as well as like tissues, we decided to check glucose influence in, new, in neurons. As you can see, GR expressing neurons uh, can still enrich glucose uh, environment but in the medium where glucose is substituted by synthetic sugar uh, to preserve osmolarity, action potential generation is much better than expressed. Uh, on the slide, you, you can see the reaction of cardiomyocyte with uh, BMGR10 uh, uh, to the addition of inositol. Uh, Uh, graphs show the change in uh, GCAMP6 fluorescence in primary mouse cardiomyocytes. Uh, the red lines uh, indicate the moment of ligand addition. Uh, the addition of the appropriate ligands led to sharp increase in calcium concentration and uh, increase in frequency of construction. Uh, before ligand application, uh, construction uh, were uh, half construction per seconds, uh, and after ligand application, two construction per seconds. Uh, so to conclude, expression of odorant receptors leads to the D for mammalian neurons in slice and in a primary culture. Apparently, they are not suitable for use in uh, chemogenetic tools in mammals. Uh, all three pairs of anotropic receptors are successfully expressed in mammalian neurons and do not lead to their death. Uh, the IR-64A IRHA pair react to the application of acetic acid uh, and uh, acid sensing uh, receptors may be of interest uh, for modulating synaptic transmission uh, as they are short by strong mutation in a synapse pH during synaptic transmission. 
receptors of the G43 line group seems to us the most promising. We have successfully expressed them, uh, them in primary cultures of neurons and cardiomyocytes. We are planning experiments with these receptors in slices and in vivo. Uh, thanks for, thanks, Reichi Sata, Kuzugive Tahara, Richard Benton, David Witcher for plasmids. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela. That's, uh, that's really wonderful. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm looking in the chat in the Q&A, but let me, uh, let's see. Yes, uh, if I may, uh, if I may ask a question then. So uh, this is uh, with the, your, your work has the, uh, the objective of uh, controlling mammalian uh, cell uh, function, right? So I was wondering yeah. how you, uh, what is your, uh, future view on how to get ligands to um, uh, to these mammalian cells when they are just in situ in the body. Uh, the uh, think about it uh, or uh, through in injection in the blood uh, or maybe we feed uh, mice and uh, sugar concentration is rise in the brain. Yes. Yeah. 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 So for some ligands, it will probably e be easier than uh, for for others, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Okay. Uh, wonderful. So uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniela. Um, and we'll now move on uh, to the to the next talk. So let me just uh, put up my slide here. So. It is an enormous pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Marcus Stensmeyer from Lund University. Well, because I've admired the fascinating research in olfactory neuroecology has done over the many past years. So much of Marcus's early work uh, and discoveries were done with Bill Hansen, uh, first as a PhD student and later as a group leader at the Max Planck Institute in Jena. Okay, so Marcus has not only worked on insects actually, uh, but has addressed questions in other arthropods. And I remember particularly, for example, uh, that when he addressed what evolutionary changes accompany the transition from marine to terrestrial environment in a robber crab. Uh, mm. But today he will talk about his research into the mechanisms by which natural insect repellents are sensed in insects. Marcus, you, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, so, thanks. Uh, uh, 22 hours into this meeting. It, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I guess everyone else is. I thought it would be just me and John Pickett left by now, but uh, there seems to be 200 <laughs> people at least here. Okay, so uh, uh, I will talk about the molecular basis of natural insect repellents. Um, from the earliest uh, time point in our species history, uh, mosquitoes and other blood-sucking, disease-spreading animals have been a huge problem. And accordingly, a lot of effort in our history has gone into preventing this from happening, figuring out ways not to be bitten by mosquitoes. And actually, not only our species, but our ancestors, and as you probably know, chimpanzees also use plants to protect themselves. This is the border cave in uh, South Africa, a rock shelter, like many others down there, uh, which have been used by humans and our earlier ancestors for at least three, 400,000 years. So archeological excavations in these rock shelters have uncovered some remarkably well-preserved plant material. And the plants to the right there are leaves from a plant called Cryptocaria woodai, or the Cape Queens. This plant is still in use today by the few remaining sand tribes in southern Africa to ward off biting insects. So these fossilized remains, they date back to this instance 80,000 years. And this is the earliest record of use, of probable use, I should say, of plants to ward off insects. Uh, since the dawn of our species then, 300 or so thousand years ago, uh, humans have identified 
wide variety of plants that are able to repel insects in uh, some more efficient than others. I will today talk about catnip or Nepeta catoria or catmint as it's also called. It's a Eurasian herb. It, uh, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it grows mostly in Southern and Eastern Europe, but it's naturalized also in Northern Europe. When I say we here, uh, I should say this is the work of Nadia Melo, postdoc in my lab, who has been working on this for several years, as well as Matthew Kapek, Oscar Arenas in the lab of Marco Gallio at uh, Northwestern University. Also contributing to this research has been Alia Fifi and Dr. Christopher J. Potter at uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. So, catnip. Uh, the earliest remains we have of catnips comes from Neolithic villages in Central Europe, dating back to um, 6000 BC or so. We don't know exactly what they used the catnip for, but they evidently cultivated it for some purpose. Uh, Pliny the Elder, uh, the great Roman scholar in his uh, Magnum Opus Naturalius Historia, mentions catnip in many places and suggests it's very good to ward off scorpions. Carl von Linné, the Swedish botanist and zoologist, the father of systematics, in many of his writings also writes about catnip. And he actually doesn't call it catnip or the Swedish equivalent today, catnip, but lussegräs, which loosely translated would be lice grass, with lice then meaning all pesky insects that bite you. So catnip has been used forever, basically, right? Not just to ward off insects, but uh, to uh, induce a sense of well being. Today we know that uh, this is not a complete list, but these are insects and arthropods, actually, including some arachnids, that are known to be repelled and/or deterred by catnip. So we have beetles, we have wasps, we have caddis flies, butterflies, through flies, through bugs, etc. So it's an enormous range of insects that find catnip repugnant. And we also know that this uh, repellency stems from these chemicals. These are iridioids, and in catnip, it's mostly the two top ones, the cis-trans nepetalactone and trans-cis nepetalactone that constitute the majority of the headspace in catnip. So these chemicals alone are responsible for the aversion. And also these chemicals are actually the ones that trigger the bizarre narcotic effect that catnip induces in cats. But that's a story for another day. So what we wanted to figure out is how does catnip actually work? And we will start with, does it actually work? So we revisited uh, slightly more. Uh, actually, yeah, the first thing we did was to check the claim by Pliny the Elder that it uh, wards off scorpions, we tested it. And uh, alas, all the scorpions, they choose uh, a scented chamber with catnip. So we have to conclude in this instance, uh, Pliny was probably misinformed. Uh, not, not entirely surprising, Pliny also suggested that the best way to brush your teeth was to use ground up mummies. Okay, so we do a more recent experiment we can repeat. This is by Tom Meissner. Uh, if Linné was the father of systematics, this would be perhaps one of the founding fathers of chemical ecology, where he tested the effect of catnip on ants. So we put catnip on uh, cockroaches, I think, and tested the ants. So we did something similar. We took crickets coated one with catnip and the other one we left alone. And you can see that all the ants, they go to the control cricket without catnip. We can also do this with uh, Drosophila melanogaster. So in this instance, we do oviposition experiments. So we have fly food, one half we mix with catnip or nepetalactone, and the other one we leave alone. And you can see that the flies, they prefer to lay eggs on the side without catnip or nepetalactone. So uh, ants are great, flies also, I love them, but uh, of course uh, there is not much need to, to have a repellent for any of those things. Yellow fever mosquito on the other hand uh, is, is a troublesome insect and you know, 22 hours into this meeting I don't think this species need any closer introduction. Suffice to say we choose to investigate the effect of catnip in Aedes aegypti. So we took a uh, blood feeders we coated one of them with catnip and the other one with uh, solvent control. And you can see that Aedes aegypti, they really don't like to feed from the blood feeder with catnip. And the same goes actually for Anopheles gambi, which are even more repelled by this. 
And this effect can be perfectly recapitulated uh, with nepetalactone alone. And actually not just nepetalactone, this is uh, a package of uh, silver wine. This is a popular cat treat in Eastern Asia. It also contains radioids, and we can see the same thing. You put some silver wine on the treatment side, the mosquitoes will avoid it. We can do another experiment. Here we take uh, catnip oil, I believe it was, yes, and you coat it on one hand, and the other hand you just take the solvent, you hold it in front of the cage, and you just see which hand the mosquitoes will try to bite from. And you can see that they go to the solvent. This experiment was provided by Ali and Chris. And, uh, this is their close proximity assay. So basically the mosquito is sitting on the edge of a cage. You approach it with this filter tip that contains either catnip, teeth or solvent. We can see there the dashed line is the anopheles. They're highly repelled by DEET, whereas AIDIS is, but not to the same extent. Uh, but we can, okay, we can do another assay here, and this one we do with AIDIS Egypti. This is the Uniport chamber. I think it was developed in Leslie Vossal's lab. And what we can see here is that uh, when you place a hand, coated with catnip inside this trap chamber at the end of the tunnel. If you do that, you catch considerably less mosquitoes. So it, uh, it doesn't really prevent them from becoming activated in the middle, but it certainly prevents them from coming close to the hand with catnip. So uh, major question that we discussed a lot, uh, discussed in the end with the reviewers back and forth, is this a spatial or a contact repellent? So we can say that catnip is effective at close range. That's clear. Uh, it's not very effective over distance, it seems, as uh, suggested by the data from the Uniport. But on the other hand, it does not require contact. So I think we can leave it at that, right? It, it's a close range repellent. Mm. So the iridioids. We have a whole bunch of those, and we know that they repel all of these different insects with very different life styles. Is it unlikely that all of these insects would have evolved of specific olfactory sensory neurons, olfactory receptors that are tuned to these rather odd chemicals? It doesn't seem very likely, right? Uh, why, why would that be? Why would they all hate these catnip chemicals? The same goes for taste. Uh, and actually, in this case, it's, it's more clear because the mosquitoes don't need to be in contact with uh, catnip or nepetalactone to be deterred by it. So taste doesn't seem very likely either as the mode of mechanism, which leaves a possibility in this guy. This is a TRIP-A1 protein. Uh, TRIP-A1 or transient receptor potential anchor in repeat one. Uh, has been implicated as being activated by other natural insect repellents, such as citronellol, and this is work by Craig Montel. So the trip A1, the, or the trip family, is a huge family, right? It's an ancient family. It's widely expressed in many different types of tissue. And it's essentially a Swiss army knife of sensory protein. They do many, many different things. They sense temperature. They sense mechanical stimuli. Uh, did I say thermal stimuli, pH, you name it, right? And TRIP-A1 is the sole member of the TRIP-A class A subfamily. Now, uh, I've given this talk a few times, and I usually get bogged down here in the details of the TRIP family, so I thought I will not go through all the caveats of this family. So we just leave it at that. If you're not familiar with the TRIP family, Google it. If not, just uh, bear with me. So suffice to say for this talk here is that trip A1 is in insects, I should say, is activated by heat. Uh, truth with modification, what's actually activating it are these electrophilic compounds or this uh, like hydrogen peroxide that are produced by cellular stress. Apart from uh, heat and things like hydrogen peroxide, trip A1 is also activated by irritant chemicals. So first question of the day then is, does catnip actually activate TRIP-A1? So to address this issue, 
we took trip A1, we expressed it in Drosophila S2 cells, and then we performed whole cell voltage clamp recordings. So in the fly, the trip A1 locus generates at least four different transcripts. So four isoforms of trip A1, previous work by Dan Tracy, Marco Gallio, and many others, have shown that uh, trip A1 A uh, is activated by heat, whereas trip A1C is activated by irritant chemicals. So we took these two, popped them into the S2 cells and performed the recordings. And not only surprising, the trip A1 isoform, trip, trip A1A, I should say, isoform is activated by heat, but not by catnip and epetalacton, whereas the C isoform is strongly activated by both catnip and epetalacton. So what about the mosquito version of trip A1? Well, indeed, they also have it. And if we go to vector base, we have a look at the locus and it looks really messy. It's complicated and more so than it seems and in Drosophila, but predicted are 10 different transcripts generated by alternative splicing. So heroic efforts of Alessia Para and Marco Gallius lab, she managed to figure out that there are probably only eight. And of these eight, she managed to amplify and clone from cDNA four of these. The trip A1F isoform did nothing when we expressed them in the S2 cells. No response to heat, to chemicals, or anything else we could think of. Whereas trip A1CKI, uh, so it basically it's the same isoform, and the trip A1H, they were both activated by heat. The G isoform, on the other hand, was activated by catnip in a dose-dependent manner and also activated by nepetalactone. Nicely, catnip or nepetalactone for that matter, not shown here, does not activate the human version of trip one which I will come back to which later since it's important for its use as a mosquito repellent. Neither does it activate the planarian version of trip one so it's not something that like um, allyl isothiocyanate, which activate all trip A1s. Catnip and the petalactone does not uniformly or unequivocally uh, activate all trip A1. So we have shown here then that catnip activates insect trip A1 in vitro. That's great, right? But as usual. The question is, is trip A1 necessary for behavior? Uh, and this, of course, is the critical experiment. Uh, the in vitro experiments do nothing good if the mosquitoes don't do anything. And luckily for us, there is a mutant. And if we test this mutant with catnip, you can see that the aversion we have seen previously is completely abolished. Amazing. And actually, not only the uh, aversion to catnip, but also the aversion to the petalactone. Neatly, if we test, do the same assay, but instead of testing the trip A1 mutant, we use another mutant from the Leslie Wasson lab, namely an orco mutant. We can see that the aversion is still there, suggesting that olfaction in this instance plays little to no role. Granted, the orco mutants are far from anosmic, I still have functional ionotropic receptors, but at least the ORCO pathway seems to be not involved in this case. And the same goes for nephetalactone. We can do the other experiment we did with the hand. You can see we coat the hand with a catnip. Well, now the mosquitoes don't mind it. And if we do the same experiment with the ORCO mutant, uh, the mosquitoes don't like the hand anymore with catnip. And lastly, we can do the assay with the uh, fly tunnel of the uniport assay. And we can see that the effect we previously saw that the mosquitoes were not attracted to the hand at the end of the wind tunnel, that effect is gone with the trip A1 mutant. So catnip functions through the nociceptive system. Uh, we, we call it a nociceptive system, and that's an uh, incorrect term. We don't know if it's pain they actually sensing, but uh, at least it feeds into a system we think uh, generates in the mosquito something that uh, perhaps is perceived by the mosquito as pain. 
or uh, thermal heat or uh, thermal heat. Thermal pain. So olfaction taste appears to play a little to no role here. So it's a bit unfortunate I choose this as topic for this meeting, uh, but uh, we have to have one talk without it. <laughs> and that holds for mosquitoes. Uh, many, many different insects that find the catnip aversive. Maybe in some of them, uh, olfaction also plays a role. And importantly, in case here, it, it's aversive to many of our most troublesome insects, and it's highly aversive. But on the other hand, it's not universally aversive to all insects. So for example, things that you like to have in your garden, if you intend to grow catnip, eh, they love it. So honeybees, bumblebees, wide assortment of butterflies really like it, etc. So in essence, it, it constitutes a uh, catnip and the iridioids are an effective and quite specific and cheap propellant, right? You can grow the catnip in your garden for next to nothing. It literally grows like a weed. So if you do plant it, uh, plant it with in a, a pot or something, otherwise your whole garden will be full of catnip. And also importantly, of course, is that it has no, at least known adverse effects on humans. On the contrary, actually, as I said before, uh, it, it induces a sense of calming in humans. So if you drink tea from catnip, you feel a bit relaxed. The hippies in California in the 60s, they actually smoked it as a substitute for weed. I tried it <laughs> and I, had a, I didn't uh, notice much, but uh, supposedly it's good. Um, and uh, this uh, cartoon here uh, sums up the results pretty well. So this is Pliny the Elder running away from the mosquitoes. He gets hold of some catnip, which emits uh, the petalodone, which in turn then activates the AAA one receptors in the mosquito. And believe it or not, this is also published in a scientific paper. So if you want to hear more about, or not hear, read in detail, you can find the paper here. It's open access and also available to anyone who wants to read. So. That's if you want to read the paper. If you want to try it out, I, I would recommend uh, buying it uh, from this little company. It's actually a colleague, former colleague of ours, a retired gentleman from Rutgers University, I think it was, that wrote to us after we published the paper, who has, uh, since retirement, started a little catnip farm called the Five Barn Farm, somewhere in New Jersey, I believe. And he sells this uh, boutique tick and insect repellents that is based on catnip. And, uh, as I said, he's a, he's a professor in organic chemistry, so you get uh, real stuff, and it's probably even enantiomerically pure. So what about uh, other plants? Uh, so we know I said that citronellol, for example, is repellent. Uh, well, it is repellent as well, known, but that it activates trip A1. Could it be that it's a, a sort of universal phenomenon? Hmm, probably not. But there are probably several of these natural insect repellents that work through this pathway. If not through trip A1, then perhaps through other trip channels. Comfor, for example, which is also highly repellent insects, has been shown again by Craig Montel to activate trip L in Drosophila at least. But those experiments were done a long time ago, so I guess they can be revisited with more mutants. So I I was a bit early here. I was so afraid of running over time, here, but I can blubber on a bit more here, no worries. But I want to just say thank you for listening, those of you still here. And I want to thank uh, Vinant. You've been a champion today, you know, you know eight hours straight. Yeah? Coral <laughs> and Walter for organizing all of this. Nadia and the rest of the crew that did all this work. So uh, just, uh, I, I still have a minute or so, right? What's next? Well, I mentioned this plant, Cryptocaria woody. That's super interesting, right? It's 80,000 years ago. That's uh, before humans invented art. We invented mosquito repellent. It's before the main exodus out of Africa. So this was published in a paper in Science by Lynn Wadley. I read the paper, got super excited, contacted Lynn. Uh, she's a very nice lady, so, or Professor Wadley, I should say, perhaps. Uh, she's an archaeologist that's worked her entire career on trying to figure out what makes humans humans. And she got, of course, very excited because, you know, this is an early sign of some complex cognitive skills. So together with 
Professor Wadley, we're trying to figure out exactly how these plants that our ancestors used 200 to 80,000 years ago actually worked. And if we figured out on that one out, we can probably figure out how they applied them and how they did it. And get some insights into what was going on in their mind back then. And also, I always wanted to be an archaeologist, and this is my chance to play at one at least for a bit. And the other topic is uh, uh, Nut Katon. It's present in a grapefruit peel, and it's super effective against uh, ticks, mosquitoes, and a wide range of other things. And it's actually been heralded by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the US, which together with a Swiss biotech company is developing this into a product that will be for sale or for sale in the US. It's not just registered in the EU. And together with Evolva, we're trying to figure out how this works. So Nutcaton works a bit different than catnip and citronella, let's say, because it actually kills the insect as well. So it's an, not only repellent, it's also an insecticide. Lastly, I think Silke mentioned this. My lab is part of this new Max Planck Center for the next generation of insect chemical ecology, trying to figure out how basically mass industrialization by the end of the 1800s have affected uh, insects and specific chemical ecology. And with that, I think I'm done. 23 minutes and four seconds. <laughs> Wonderful, Marcus. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Thank there you. are already a number of questions in the uh, in the Q and A and the and the chat. The first one is from uh, Greg Pask. So, so do you have any idea about whether the different TRPA one isoforms are expressed in the same cells and can form a heterotetramer that can be activated by both heat and catnip? Ooh, tricky question, Greg. Uh, I don't know, actually. So we, we, we don't know exactly where all of these things are expressed. So Chris and Ali did some experiments uh, using functional imaging. And that suggests that um, if, if you screen AITC that, that universally activates uh, TRIP-A1 and you stimulate with nepetalactone, you can see that the same cells on the antenna are activated, suggesting that there might be TRIP-A1 uh, isoforms on the mosquito antenna that are activated by nepetalactone. But nepetalactone is, oh no, not mixing things up, TRIP-A1 is widely expressed throughout the insect body. So it might not necessarily be that it's just in the antenna, it might be in the legs or God knows where, trachea perhaps. Or, uh, and uh, that was not an answer, it was a politician's answer to a complicated question. What was Greg's <laughs> answer, a question if it's, uh, I, I don't know, frankly, I don't know, but it yeah. uh, could be. No. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, you, you already started on one of the next questions, uh, answering one of the next questions. And that was uh, from uh, Carolina Reisemann. Uh, so uh, she says, great, uh, great talk as always, Marcus. Uh, where do you think the TRPA1 catnip sensitive receptor is expressed, at least in mosquitoes? Have you looked at marigolds too? Long used in home gardens, known to protect and beautiful. Yes, I think uh, I have to double check. What is the Swedish name for it? Marigold. Yeah, that's one of the things I think we're thinking of testing, but we haven't done it yet. So where it is expressed, it, it's, it's a complicated issue, really, because of all the different isoforms. So I think you can take uh, probably any tissue from a mosquito and you can find trip A1 expressed almost, right? But then you have to figure out the exact uh, isoform that is there. And so we haven't done it, but uh, so obviously something we would... Uh, I think we have done a little bit of it, but it was inconclusive. So we left it up. Yes, so a follow-up question on uh, that is from Teruyuki Matsunaga, who's asking, uh, related to this question, uh, do, you, do you mean that it's, although they're not olfactory receptors, uh, it is mediated by olfactory neurons and thereby, uh, where do these cells project in the antenna lobe? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good question. So um, the, the imaging data we got uh, suggests that it uh, might so this was done with uh, Chris is here. Uh, it was an orco line that expressed GCAMP. So, and we saw the signal from the orco neuron. So that would suggest just that they're co-expressed in olfactory sensory neurons. But I think that has been suggested before. But um, uh, yeah. those experiments are easier, obviously, to do in the Drosophila than to sort out in a mosquito. I mean, even if we have 
tools now. Uh, they're not as sophisticated as in philosophy. Yes. And then a question from the Q&A uh, box. Uh, it's a, a great talk, Marcus. Was there, this is from Marcello Lorenzo. Was there any consequence for the mutant mosquitoes in the feeder assays after feeding on the catnip-treated membrane? No, they seem to be quite happy. Oh. Uh, uh, well, maybe they had a sense of well-being. I don't know, like the hippies. No, yeah. I don't know. No, they, they, they don't seem to uh, uh, mind it too much. Uh, Drosophila is a bit more picky, but uh, that has to do with other things. You know, when they, they um, some of them, it, it's a bit sticky, the oil, so they get stuck in the oil. I yeah. think that's what's killing them rather than the actual chemicals yeah. inside. Yeah. But do you think uh, that catnip is an indicator of, uh, is itself toxic or uh, to some insects or is an indicator of toxicity in plants? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the Tom Meissner paper, there is a science paper from the 1960s where he asked, uh, it's amazing, you know, what you could get away with in the 60s. So he, he asked, was at the summer house, I think, and took out the chair on the table and he put a white light there and attracted insects and just poked them with the stick with uh, an epitalactone. And then he saw which insects uh, ran away, <laughs> which stayed. And um, the paper is called the raison d'etre of uh, an epitalactone or something like this. And uh, he suggests it's a defensive mechanism from plants. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But maybe it doesn't need to be toxic. It's just if it activates the triple one, it, it kind of causes irritation in the insects. And right. the animals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, John Pickett is wondering, what is the mechanism of action on cats? Uh, uh, yeah. Good question. You were careful to say that it didn't affect us, but it certainly affects cats. Yes, it, it triggers, the, I think it's the opioid reward system in some way. There was a paper recently about it. I'm I, not even, sure I even I... reviewed it, I should have remembered. <laughs> I'm, not sure. uh, I'm not sure I was convinced by that paper, but uh, I mean, oh, the aphids, of course, use uh, nepetalactone as one of their components of the sex pheromone, and they have a very specific olfactory neuron in the secondary rhine area on the uh, sec on the third antennal segment tuned specifically to the particular isomer that you've been showing and another one for the nepeta lactol the reduced version with with even more isomers very very specific it would be interesting to know if you put those into um, uh, a fly empty neuron uh, if you suddenly get uh, repellency Mm. Uh, so, so the fly uh, is also actually sensitive to these chemicals because it's a pheromone of one of their main predators, uh, these uh, wasps, parasitoid yes, wasps. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. but they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're slightly different and should have separate olfactory neurons for those isomers. Mm. So that's uh, nepetalactol and iridomyrmesine, I think, yeah. But the fly is not sensitive to, the olfactory system doesn't seem to be sensitive to iridomyrmesine. The peta lactone. No, as it stands. Yeah. But but, yeah then, you can swap it, it around and see. Put it yeah. into, into the empty neuron and then you would see. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there, there's one more question. Uh, uh, do you recommend to grow sugar beets or catnips? Which one would be more efficient? Well, both. To both. Both, of course. Yeah. Okay. No, no. <laughs> You get borscht and you get uh, friendly with the neighbor cats. And <laughs> okay. I think catnip is probably more effective. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, I, th I think um, right. that's, uh, that's wonderful. Th thank you very much again, uh, Marcus. And uh, thank you thank for your nice great, discussion. Great also talk, for the Fantastic. Wonderful. Thanks, John. Okay, so. Um, next talk um, is uh, by, by Sharon Hill, uh, who is an associate professor at the Uni uh, Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Okay. So um, she will talk about the regulation of antennal transcription throughout a mosquito's first gonotrophic cycle. Sharon, go ahead. Uh, of course, first I'd like to thank um, you guys for running this. I know everyone does, but we can't say it enough. I think it's been a wonderful experience so far, and, and I'm very happy to participate. Um, just to keep everyone in contact, I'm very recently back from vacation, so <laughs> this talk has been 
thrown together as something that I would like to talk uh, a little bit about and something that I think we now have an opportunity um, as a community to kind of follow. And so the talk uh, is Age Matters, regulation of the antennal transcription um, throughout a mosquito's first life, uh, first chronotrophic cycle. Now, one of the things that we do, I think, as um, certainly as chemical ecologists, definitely as mosquito chemical ecologists, is we talk about behaviors as though they exist kind of in a vacuum. Um, this mosquito is host seeking and therefore she uh, does this set of behaviors and it's stereotypical and so on. Um, one thing that we forget when we do that, uh, and it's not just host seeking, it's other behaviors as well, but we forget something that we've known for a long time, which is these behaviors are cyclical. Um, they are often very rhythmical, certainly through the daytime. We've got circadian rhythms that are, are underlying um, a lot of these behaviors, and we have the gonotrophic cycle. So age plays probably quite a role here. So is it time now, now that we've started to look, you know, in depth at some of these, um, these kind of mechanisms, is it time for us to sort of tune up or turn on our resolution and to, to look a little bit more closely and take into account some of this uh, rhythmic or cyclic activity? And um, just to kind of remind everybody, so dial rhythms in mosquitoes, I'm gonna talk predominantly today about uh, Aedes aegypti, but a lot of this is true for most of the mosquito species, not the rhythms themselves, but that they have the rhythms. So in Aedes aegypti, we know their rhythm is that you are much more likely um, to get bitten in the afternoon and in the late afternoon. Um, and here, this is just locomotor activity, but it's a pretty good indicator where um, as you start at the beginning of the day, that's the lights on at this Zeitgeber time of zero. Uh, as you go through the day, the first half of the day, there is some activity, but not a lot. But when you get into that second half of the daytime, there's quite a bit more activity. Um, when you come into the nighttime, again, there's a reduction in the activity. So we really do have host seeking that's happening and activity that's happening um, at specific times of the day. And if we think about this, it makes a lot of sense to then look a little bit closer. And now um, Clement Vinoget's lab um, with, I think it's Diane Eilerts, took a look at this in a, a, a nicely controlled way. And they took a look and they said, okay, in behavior, do we have differences in olfactory sensitivity to specific odorants over the time of the day? And the answer is yes, we do. Uh, and then they said, okay, does this behavioral um, effect, is that mirrored by what we see in physiology? So are the neurons behaving in a similar way or can we follow a similar pattern? And they do. So this is quite a nice study to remind us that yeah, host seeking or the behavior that we're looking at is very likely to be something that we should take a closer look at when we are looking. And of course, when you look at actual biting rates, so this is um, human landing catches in Ghana, you can see that it is at the later part of, of um, photophase, so of, of the daytime, that we are seeing the majority of bites happening. Um, and that's between, you know, zeitgeist time 10 and 12. So what we did was we chose a window slightly before this time during the day. And we said, we're going to give ourselves two hours. Unfortunately, we started with giving ourselves three hours. And we found out very quickly that that was too much. Um, we found that the variation was quite high. So we narrowed it down. And we're now looking at a two-hour window. And we're looking at a two-hour window an hour to two hours ahead of the peak of behavior. And the reason we're doing that is because we're looking at the message and not the protein. So the message takes time to be actually transmitted into protein. So we're taking, we're, we're, we're sort of shifting our window back in order to look at the transcriptome analysis at, at, at a time point we think that the most activity will be happening. So we've taken that time window and now we've gone to look at each day from day one through to day 10 um, in the first gonotrophic cycle of a mosquito. Now, 
Here, these are just sugar-fed mosquitoes, what I'm showing right now. And for those of you who are looking in uh, or who are starting up and are thinking that only important, you know, uh, references are coming in the 2000s, think again. Most of the data that is occurred in this or that's compiled into this data happened before the 1990s. So there's a lot of very good, very uh, high resolution behavioral results that have been done back in the second half of uh, the 20th century. So don't forget to go looking there. Um, so this is compiled from, from, from quite a wide variety of sources. And if you want to see what sources they are, um, they're actually in this review that we've, we've written this year. So you can take a look and find those, those sources. But what this tells us is that over time, from when the mosquito is initially emerging and to day 10, we actually see not only increasing activity, we see increasing host seeking, but we also don't see that the host seeking is staying consistent. Um, we don't go up to 100% host seeking and stay up at 100% or 90% host seeking. We actually see quite a bit of variation, day-to-day um, -day variation in this behavior. And it's also evident that we see changes in the, sensitive, in, in the mosquitoes um, behavior when it comes to floral seeking as well. So this is something that we were quite interested in, and we decided to also take a look after you blood feed, do you also see a similar kind of fluctuation? And we found that, yeah, you do, um, not unexpectedly. So if you blood feed um, around day five, um, and this can shift day five, day six, seemed to be the time that most people were blood feeding. What we found was that you get this variation in, for example, resting behavior and how long it takes to come back to floral seeking after you've had a blood meal. Um, the time to resumption of blood meal seems quite fixed. Once they oviposit, the blood meal, the, the, the host seeking uh, does get turned on. So that seems to be quite fixed, but the other behaviors are also fluctuating during this time. So we decided to take a look at the transcriptomes, as I, I said at the beginning of this, the antennal transcriptomes, and we decided to say, okay, let's take a look at the ORs in this case. Um, we'll take a look at all the ORs and we'll see what do we get? Do we get a random distribution or do we actually see a pattern? And what we found was we see a pattern in the um, expression over time. So what we see is from day one to day five, we have quite a high expression of the odorant receptors, they're all being expressed, not all, but a wide variety of them are being expressed very close to their maximum amount. And then as you go past day five down to day 10, you get this reduction in expression. Then we took a look after blood feeding. So we blood fed on day five, and we also see a very consistent pattern here. We see a pattern where there's an increase in the olfactory receptor uh, expression up to um, 48 hours, 72 hours, 96 hours after the blood meal. At 96 hours when the oviposit, it's back down to very close to the same levels that we saw just post blood feeding at 24 hours after that oviposition event. So again, we have quite a stereotypical response in the majority of these uh, odorant receptors, and we're calling this motif one. And as it turns out, when we looked at um, the other receptors, so we looked at other chemosensory related families, I'm only showing three here, but there are others in the paper if you wanna go take a look. Um, these chemosensory families, the ORs and the IRs, they predominantly show this motif one, this high expression, then tapering off as they age. And in the blood feeding, this increase followed by oviposition and decrease. However, the odorant binding proteins actually show two motifs. Some of them show this motif one, but others show a very inverted version of this motif. So they start very low and they increase uh, in, in expression or in abundance as they age. And certainly it's the, uh, a similar pattern after blood feeding, although it's a little less clear 
but it seems that they start at a high level of expression, reduce that expression, and then return after a reposition to a higher level of expression. As I said before, we're talking about, you know, sort of the average group. So in the first column here, you see this is our average group of the odorant receptors, but not all of them are behaving like this. And this is where I think we can, uh, we've been missing a bit of a trick. This is where we can look and say, aha, here we have an interesting receptor. It's not behaving in a similar way to the others. And so OR117 um, starts as being very high, but very quickly reduces and stays low in its expression. Um, OR42 has a similar um, uh, decrease in expression, but it seems to be a little bit more linear. Um, so we have, but when we look at uh, post blood feeding, OR117 behaves very much like the rest of the ORs. And OR42, it's a little less clear. Um, there's a much lower uh, abundance level for OR42. So, but this gives us the opportunity um, because we have such large data sets to be a bit picky and, and come in and, and maybe cherry pick a little and look at these um, receptors that are different from what we're seeing in the entire, uh, in the overall group. So I said I was going to talk predominantly about Aedes aegypti. Um, so at the top, you see the Aedes aegypti um, behavioral profile I talked about before that we culled from the literature. We are currently um, working on Anopheles gambi, and we are doing the behavioral experiments ourselves now in the lab. Um, and when I say we, I actually mean Julia. Julia is our star new PhD student. Um, she's part of that NGEIS program that has been discussed, uh, Silke brought up and Marcus has spoken of, and I think other people spoke of earlier. Um, so she's one of our, our, our new recruits on that program, and she's been working incredibly hard. She's only been with us a few months. And yet what we can see if we compare these two um, behavioral profiles is that they certainly look different. The behavior for blood feeding is starting much earlier in the Anopheles. Day one, she um, has been showing that she's getting almost 50% of the day ones are actually taking a blood meal. Um, and, and she's sort of put in my ear that a third of those are actually laying eggs. So we have a very different scenario, um, at least in younger uh, insects um, in the Anopheles gambia. So that's gonna be interesting for us to follow. And so Julia will be following this. She's going to be looking, or she's currently looking at the volume of diet and vibe, not just the percentage or the pro proportion who are feeding, but also how much they're taking in. And she's also going to be doing some Y-tube experiments um, with floral uh, host odors and urine odors um, to fill in the rest of this, um, this picture for us. Adding to that, we have um, Vicente Mercado, who is from Brazil. He was with us for one year. He is the person who has sort of taken the massive numbers of data sets that we had and put them together in order to come up with this single data set for uh, Aedes aegypti so we can look at the entire, the entire um, uh, 10 days at the beginning. Um, but he also is taking on the transcriptome analysis for Anopheles gambia, and all of this tissue has been collected over months and months and, and much tears. And so it's out now and it's being sequenced. And when it comes back, Vicente will take it on and he will hopefully come up with the new picture that we will, we will uh, be able to show you about um, how important it is for, uh, for us to take into consideration that a host seeking or a floral seeking mosquito also has an age associated with her. Um, and that the time of day is going to play quite a role in whether she is or is not interested in finding that host or that flower. So in conclusion, it's a very simple conclusion, age matters. Um, by controlling for age and dial rhythms, I believe we will increase our resolution and improve our chances at actually describing the underlying mechanisms that we are interested in as a community. Um, 
So I've pointed out a few people during the talk. I will point out Rickard. Um, he's the professor at our group uh, here at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. And he and I work very closely together. We share our students and um, pretty much, yeah, it's, it's uh, quite the jazz session when we all get together. So it's, it, it's a very nice working environment. Um, Anais has been uh, our PhD student. She has graduated. She is now a postdoc at Virginia Tech. Um, we have Julia, who I mentioned has just joined us, and we have uh, Vicente, who has finished his PhD uh, a couple of weeks ago and is now taking on his postdoc work. I gave a little bit of a plug for our group because you will be seeing a postdoc advertisement coming out for our group uh, very shortly. So if anyone's interested in looking for a postdoc and you're interested in these kinds of questions, please, uh, please give, me, uh, give me contact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, thank you. That's a fascinating talk to see the transcriptional profile change with different, uh, in different parts of the gonotrophic cycle. So let's see if there are uh, questions. Um, yeah, so um, uh, the first question is, uh, uh, have you looked at sex differences in transcription over dial cycles post-emergence? Not yet. Um, it is definitely something we're interested in doing. Um, I've, we have looked at some comparisons at different time points, but we don't have a complete set yet. So the, the short answer to that is no. Uh, the longer answer is we're trying to get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, the next question is from uh, Zolt Karpati. Uh, thanks for this great talk. Question, what are the ligands of OR117 uh, and OR42? Um, we don't know the ligands for, for, for 42. Um, we do know the ligands for 117. Unfortunately, I am under a gag order at the moment and <laughs> not to reveal. They yes. will be coming out soon. Um, I can tell you that they are interested in um, predominantly for floral cues, um, but it, it's, uh, that's kind of as much as I should say. Sure, sure, sure. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see. Um, Jason, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question? Yes, thank you. Hi, Sharon. Always enlightening. Really appreciate your talk here. You. Uh, my question is just about mechanisms for um, how this, these transcripts are regulated. If you have any insights into that, have you looked at you know, potential inputs? Um, I'm less interested, you might be surprised, in the post-blood feeding mechanisms, maybe neuropeptides and other kinds of inputs, but, but I'm talking about the deal rhythms of their circadian stuff or even the age-related mechanisms. Any thoughts yeah. there? I did look into um, transcription factors because we thought transcription factors would be a gold mine for us. So the first thing we did was look for those two motifs. Did we have transcription factors that also showed either motif one or motif two? Um, and could we correlate those transcription factors with uh, the ages? Um, so uh, we do have a description of quite a few of uh, transcription factors that follow those patterns. Um, so there are options there. We jumped at the idea that it could have been fruitless because of course we've seen the few things that have come out recently that are fruitless. Um, unfortunately, fruitless does not seem to be one that is clear cut in our case, at least not in the antenna. Um, so if this is being regulated in the antenna, that's what we've looked at. If it's being regulated elsewhere, uh, I, haven't, I haven't taken a look at that yet. But I would love to do, um, it's not going to happen soon, but I would love to do, you know, some promoter bashing, even just something that's going to help us kind of figure out, grab one of these motif one receptors and play. Um, but I have to get funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sure. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, Carolina, would you also like to ask your question uh, directly? Thank you. That's so cool. Uh, I was wondering there's these populations, Wyoming and Smithy, where there are some populations which are obligated non-feeders and some. Uh, so I was looking at those particular, maybe thinking because they had the same genetic background, maybe there are very strong differences in expression, olfactory receptors, ionotropics that you mentioned for this IRS and Coolex that you mentioned now. Yeah, I, we haven't looked. Um, but we have uh, three populations in uh, three very closely related species, but also three populations 
from um, Anopheles arabiensis. Um, and we also have the Anopheles arabiensis, Kaluzzi, uh, Gambi, and Quad. And so we've been looking at those, um, but again, it takes quite a long time and a bit of money. <laughs> um, so we're not there yet. We have, as I said, we have kind of time points, but we don't have anything that's uh, that, that's a complete picture just yet. Yeah, but I agree. I think that there will be some very, very interesting things if we're able to look at different populations who show the phenotypes that are different. Um, we are also looking at right now with at um, infection. So we have uh, an infection story that we're working with um, with malaria, and we're seeing that there are changes in um, in the dial periods around biting and around. Um, yeah, their host seeking behaviors. And those do possibly correlate uh, again with the transcriptome. So it's interesting. It's stuff we all have to both, I, I think we all have to follow. <laughs> it's, it's bigger than, than, than just our lab. So yeah, I'm glad to hear you're interested. Okay, wonderful. So um, uh, Saeed uh, Mohammed uh, Umarani would like to ask, uh, uh, he says, thank you for your great talk. Did you take a look at internal hormones on the olfactory behavior of blood-fed mosquitoes? Um, there's a couple of papers uh, from our lab, but also from a few other labs, um, including Leslie Voschel's group, where they've looked at, um, uh, they've looked at, um, what have they looked at? Serotonin, they've looked at dopamine, um, they've looked at uh, uh, a lot of statin, um, so we do know a little bit about how those, uh, those um, hormones are affecting the system, but it hasn't been put together with the transcriptomics in the antenna, as far as I know yet. Um, so that would be a nice connection. Uh, but if you want, it, you know, contact me if you want a few more papers, I can, I can certainly send them your way. Excellent. Okay, let me just see. Any more coming through? No? OK. Well, uh, thank you very much again, Sharon, for this fascinating talk uh, and for the, the lovely questions that were asked uh, and the discussion about it. OK, so uh, with that, uh, we, we move actually to uh, our last speaker of this 24-hour uh, symposium. So it is an enormous honor and pleasure to introduce Professor John Pickett, who will close the circle around the globe. Uh, Walter Leal and I will co-host and co-moderate John Pickett's talk. So John, for many years, led the chemical ecology research in Rothamsted, and I was overjoyed when he became professor of biological, biological chemistry here at Cardiff University, actually. So his contributions to science have been honored by numerous awards and prizes. He's a fellow of the Royal Society and an international member of the National Academy of Sciences, as well as a member of the German National um, uh, Academy of Natural Sciences, Leopoldina. So what stands out for me is his enthusiasm for science, in particular, of course, on the chemically mediated interactions between various organisms, including pests attacking plants and animals, and that simply interacting with him always raises new ideas and ways of thinking about research questions. So John is an inspiration to work with, and I look very much forward uh, to your talk, talk, John, on contextual olfactory signaling in insects. Well, that was a very kind and gracious uh, introduction you gave me there, uh, Wynand. I'm, I'm afraid there are a lot of stories about me over the years cavorting around at social events that I always dread when I meet up with the, uh, with the chemical ecology and olfactory okay. groups, but uh, that was very kind. Um, of course, we must give uh, first authorship and indeed senior authorship to uh, Walter Leal for this wonderful concept. And uh, of course, I must thank uh, Wayne and himself and uh, uh, the other uh, moderators and chairs of this uh, 
ongoing meeting around the world. But those who I'd like to thank most are the people who've been speaking throughout this 24 hours. I've not managed to be here the whole time, but I, I started off yesterday morning in California. I didn't quite make uh, Australia, but uh, certainly I was up until one o'clock listening last night and first thing at the crack of dawn today to get the new one. And the talks have been wonderful because we've had such a diversity of issues and uh, it, it's been very exciting, I think. And finally, the attendees. When I look at the list of attendees, I really wish I was able to communicate with many of them directly because I see many good friends, old friends and, uh, and people that I've, I've known and spoken to at meetings over the years. So I'm going to actually pick up on a number of issues which were touched upon by, uh, by various speakers and they relate to what is now a well-known phenomenon, and that is the contextual nature of olfactory, uh, olfactory signaling. But when I started in this game with the first identification of a mosquito pheromone that I made with Brian Lawrence, and there he is uh, with, a, with a glass of wine um, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, with who was his PhD student at the time, Mary Cameron, for a while with her maiden name, Mary Pyle. And um, he kept telling me two things. One, as a chemist, I understood, and that was that the mosquitoes were actually perceiving the overposition pheromone that he wanted me to identify uh, at a distance. It was clearly a big molecule, but it was certainly volatile and they perceived it accordingly uh, by olfaction. But he also said that it wouldn't work unless you had water which was actually London tap water. And I said to him, but surely you use distilled water, very pure water. He said, no, 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 it doesn't work, London tap water. And of course, it was the context of the smell which the mosquitoes knew would, in an anthropomorphic uh, way of describing it, would contain nutrient for them because Brian put some of the nutrient in there for them. But in fact, when we started to look uh, into the field, uh, which is, um, there's the identification in chemcoms, and there's the, um, the, the, the first field results, which Mary took part in. And there she is with Timothy Onyango from the ECP, and now the Thomas Odiambo field station at Mbita Point. And you certainly couldn't count the egg rafts that were attracted to be laid in these lunch boxes unless you had that in a background of a smell which conveyed the idea that there would be nutrient in the water. And one of the common compounds which is featured immensely in this meeting with some fantastic new work from Walter Lial's group, Jason Pitts, and finally today by Jonathan Bobot, all wonderful stuff. And that was the fact that we found by GC uh, EAG and GC single cell recordings that methyl indole was very common to many of these oviposition site cues. And in fact, there's a rather quaint list of other compounds which on that cell give virtually no response except at very, very high stimulus concentrations. Uh, and they are quaint because people at that time were thinking that there were generalist receptors. And so oviposition site uh, cues were going to be picked up by those. Well, it's not true anymore uh, that it is uh, for any aspect of olfaction. We're basically reliant upon quite specific responses, though we've got some uh, general responses in, in some particular occasions. And you can see indole is not responding to this um, to, on this cell hardly at all. And that was uh, really explained very clearly by the mutant work that uh, Walter Lial himself did. Uh, and of course, um, this is crucial for the Culex quinquefasciatus mosquitoes to show that the site that they're going to uh, aggregate and lay their eggs at uh, is safe to do so by having uh, nutrient there. And this pheromone works for all the Culex genus that we've managed to get hold of and look at. And that really shows the context, as does the commercial version of it. We actually patented it uh, when we identified it and uh, not for 
great financial gain, of course, but to help its commercialization, that didn't actually work. Uh, and it was only much later when companies uh, stimulated by the fact that Culex mosquitoes were the vector for um, the West Nile virus uh, affecting the US uh, started to sell hand over fist the mosquito pheromone. But there you are with the admission of the contextual nature of the pheromone in providing pond water or rainwater with some grass clippings in to ferment and give rise to various compounds, including um, methyl, indole or scatol. I've spent a great deal of my life so far on, uh, on aphids, and I was set to do that with one and now moving uh, to Cardiff, as he's just kindly referred to. But uh, in fact, um, our first grant together is on mosquitoes. So we're, 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 we're beating a retreat from aphids. But I am going to touch on them because they are the central point of my final um, contention about contextual molecular nature. We tried uh, in the um, earlier parts of the uh, 2010s to engineer wheat to produce the aphid alarm pheromone e to farnazine because we already knew from a paper back in uh, the 80s with Richard Gibson when you could publish in Nature with only two authors that some plants could actually imitate the release of e to farnazine from the cornical droplets by using specialised um, foliar trichomes. Uh, we couldn't at the time put foliar trichomes in there, but we did manage to engineer the plant to produce constitutively um, the e beta farnazine in a very pure form. It had to be pure because the co-produced sesquiterpene that you get in plants, this isomer of caryophylline, uh, is detected by the aphid on co-located olfactory neurons with the sensilla in the uh, pro in the distal um, antennal segment in the primary rhinarium there and switches off the effect. And I'm not going to show that. I'm going to show an even more nice uh, picture of two cells co-located in the ladybird antenna. It's a very awkward thing to get at. So Christine found who was doing the work. But nonetheless, with two very, very clearly discriminated cells by their amplitude, one to farnazine and one to the caryophylline. And when the caryophylline cell fired, the ladybird wouldn't then be looking around for aphids to eat because it would know that the caryophylline accompanied E. beta farnazine when it was produced by a plant, possibly to try and fool them. So there's another contextual issue relating to pheromones, but now being used by parasitoids at the higher, at the, the predators are at the higher trophic level. But right back in those days, and you can see uh, in 1987, which you've probably not gone back to following uh, the comments that Sharon Hill very wisely made in the last very nice presentation, we were asked by Skip Nolt and, Bob, and, and Bill Bowers, the late Bill Bowers, only recently died, a very towering figure in chemical ecology, why it was that Lipaphis erysmi didn't respond to E beta farnazine. There must be other components of the pheromone. Well, we couldn't find anything. And I, by that time, got some very neat ways of looking at single cornical droplets. I could capture the cornical droplet from which the pheromone was released and, uh, and look at it on just one cornical droplet sample, very high resolution and sensitivity on the mass spec directly, and knew there was nothing else in there that might contribute to this. But what we had was a response that was a little bit more than nothing in this case because of where we were applying it to aphids in a colony which were feeding of course on the crucifer and producing well I'm sure you guess it now it's uh, if you've not read the paper but nonetheless we looked into various of the sensilla on the antenna we moved down from the e beta farnazine sensillum on the uh, distal uh, uh, segment in the primary rhinarium to the primary rhinarium on the uh, on the uh, proximal uh, segment the fifth segment and in fact in there this is from Lester Wadhams who was my first collaborator on uh, on single cell recording and EAG recording and he found that um, whilst the P 
peak I uh, right along the trace there, uh, which is EB to Farnesine, a very small titer, where was uh, not at all responding to anything in that sensillum, whereas two cells in there were responding to compounds which were catabolites of the glucosinolates that, of course, are in the host plants of lipophys arrhythmia. And only when you get certain of those glucosinolates do you actually get the full uh, bioassay response. So now we've got uh, the moderation of the pheromone with the host site, with the food, as uh, S Silke Sachs is looking at the mechanism so wonderfully uh, earlier on today uh, referred to. And bringing us right up to date with the um, GM wheat, uh, wheat elite variety transformed to release EB to farnesine, this very pure form. Uh, we found that there was a much bigger response, very much significantly different from the EB to farnesine pure. And in fact, we see there in the wheat with this serial aphid metapolophium diarodum, we see uh, a, a synergism uh, of that pheromonal effect with the pure compound and uh, we, we really must uh, get on with identifying that no though uh, um, my disruption in moving from Rothamsted now to uh, uh, Wynant and his colleagues where we are where we're we're, we're, we're we're probably going to move away from aphids because uh, of our, our, our new grant on uh, on on diptera now other pheromones uh, can rely upon much more sophisticated semiochemicals uh, than simply catabolites of toxicants that they've adapted to. And Cosmopolites sordidus, the, the, the weevil that um, is known as the banana weevil. And you can see Haruna Bremar, who uh, is retired from this business now, but he's, he's actually borrowed the panga, the machete, from the farmer standing to his right. And that's actually the best treatment that smallholder farmers have against this beetle. It's a massive beetle and does immense damage. Uh, they don't have access because they can't afford it, of course. Um, some may say good. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, they don't have access to imidacloprid. But Haruna had found a very surprising thing that although it's customary to use with the pheromone um, of the beetle that's been long known, um, it, it's customary to use some of the plant material. He found that it was the senescing leaves of the banana tree that actually were the powerfulest uh, synergist of the pheromone and attractants in their own right. And so with electrophysiology, you can see we've actually got a peak that really is not a peak. It's down on, I don't know whether my cursor is visible down here. Can you see my cursor at one end? No. Sorry, no, I can't. No. It doesn't matter. There's a there's a marking there for this for the retention time where there is a very, very powerful EAG peak. And and that's a peak really which you've got to search very hard to find a mass spec. But you get a McClafferty rearrangement and that with a retention time gives you some idea of, of, of what it is. But there are two asymmetric carbons, four isomers. There's the actual peak for the compound. Ah, there's the actual peak for the compound, and there's the peak from the um, uh, the, 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 nat the 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 natural product um, uh, in which we've taken the electrophysiology here for the uh, mixture of all four isomers, two enanti uh, two enantiomeric pairs, and an, an, an unnatural enantiomer of that one, this pair is actually active, but it's not present in the natural product because the EAG is to that little peak there. And that confirms phenomenal activity of this particular isomer. And we just completed, this is just very recently published, uh, field trials with Samson Abagali and Haruna Bremar and other people from the uh, um, Nkami uh, Nkrumo University, Technical University in, in Kusumo, in um, uh, Kumasi in, in, northern, in northern Ghana, uh, and uh, have shown that with some very simple uh, waste water bottle traps, we can just use the, the, the compound itself and the extract of the senescing leaves, much more powerful attractant than the fresh leaves, and that it synergizes sorted in, which means that it's a little bit going to be a little bit easier if people buy the compound than cutting pieces out of trees for industrial 
industry of banana farming, but for the farmers themselves who can't afford the imidacloprid, but they also can't afford the sordid in. And, and so they can just use this uh, extract, which we've managed to do in this uh, in this uh, paper by using some local material to extract the, uh, the, 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 the synergist on. Again, moderating the pheromone, which doesn't work without the plant compounds. I'm not particularly worked on the pheromone identification of the cecidomide uh, blossom midges. It's um, uh, and and uh, and and, uh, and and plant midges. Uh, it's been the reserve of colleagues in Sw in Sweden, particularly uh, Ilva Hilba, and a lot of very nice chemistry done by Vitko Franke. But we are very very interested because these pheromones are phenomenally powerful in getting a synthesis that's commensurate with their use directly. And Thomas Worth at Cardiff now in chemistry has moved our very nice uh, ring closing metathesis um, diastereoselective synthesis into microfluidics, which gives us a very cheap source of this. But still, we want to know what the wheat plant's doing and it will help us breed more resistance in the wheat plant because there is resistance there, but we don't know the exact chemical nature of it. Well, you can quickly see that in an olfactometer, this cecidomide uh, responds very nicely to wheat volatiles. And now, uh, Bruce, Toby Bruce, uh, who, who is now at Keele University in the UK, he left around the same time as I left Rothamsted, uh, did some nice tricks with uh, mixtures that he knew that uh, uh, the uh, wheat, orange wheat blossom midge would, would respond to. And when he took one compound and just made a very small increase in the amount of that compound, uh, I mean, he did a lot of other stuff that didn't work, but this really hit the uh, the, the, the news, because look what it's done, as opposed to being a, a component of an essential component, five component mixture, which is not significantly different from the four component, but certainly from the three, then you when you perturb the, the, the composition just by this very small amount, not, a, not, not an, an order of magnitude, you actually take it out entirely in terms of, 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 of attractiveness. And for a GM plant, that's very nice because of course, all you've got to do is overexpress the gene for making that compound. And it's an oxidation product of a terpenoid, uh, which we rather know well. Coming to mosquitoes then, uh, 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 an essential uh, component of any insect uh, control or insect um, uh, olfaction meeting, uh, work led by um, an ex-PhD student of mine, now professor at uh, the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, James Logan, and the first author, Ailey Robinson, PhD student. We found that when children are infected with plasmodium uh, falciparum, the sub-Saharan African um, pathogen causing malaria in that region, uh, that it enhanced various compounds which contributed to increased attraction. Well, that's fine. And people have talked about them being related to uh, human attractiveness at this meeting. However, if you go back to James's PhD thesis, where he used individual people uh, and their attractiveness in a olfactometer that you can see there initially Aedes aegypti, the, the, the lab rat of mosquitoes, then uh, this person down here, Y05, uh, was really completely unattractive to uh, mosquitoes. They would fly by him. They'd also fly, um, also Scottish biting midge would fly by him. And so when we looked on the electrophysiology, we were looking actually for extra compounds not a lack of attractancy, but extra compounds, because based on the plant work we'd been doing, uh, which I've talked about briefly, uh, it was very clear that repellency or non-attractiveness, as we're talking here, in a contextual sense, uh, related to production of extra chemicals, which interfere, as you saw there, the 6-methyl-5-heptene-2-ohm doing with that um, attractiveness for for the uh, orange wheat blossom midge. And so with some neat statistics, we managed to find clusters of compounds that were at heightened level in unattractive people as opposed to attractive people. And with that, we found that we had a group of just a few compounds, uh, slightly strange numbering for various reasons, which contributed when you add them 
in the context of human natural attractiveness um, to the unattractiveness of individual people. There's field work with Jenny Mordew up at Aberdeen in Scotland in the Scottish Biting Midge. We've marked out her arm there. There's the arm on the, uh, on the right, which has not been protected, whereas the mixture uh, of just two of those compounds there uh, has been in fact um, responsible for reducing to pretty well nothing. There are all those little black spots are, and red markings around some of them where Jenny has been bit by, bitten by hundreds of midges in the three minutes of that exposure. Uh, but that compound three is in fact one of the compounds that we were seeing might be an attractant. So it's a contextual issue. It's not a given that it's going to be an attractant or a repellent. Same applies with Anopheles gambiae now in, uh, in, in Africa with colleagues at the ECP uh, and an arm in cage testing of the natural uh, human compounds. In fact, in the one-to-one -one mix, we've actually got the six, the six methyl five heptene tuone and the geronyl acetone, and that pretty well beats uh, DEET, but of course DEET is very nice and persistent. These are very, very volatile compounds. But we can see that uh, the compounds, the aldehydes that I mentioned, do contribute to attractiveness uh, with, uh, with the, the main vector of the plasmodia that cause malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. And so finally, let me move back to aphids and, and plants. And we can obviously, like many of you do, take the volatiles from intact plants. We don't extract them anymore. We use clean air from this piece of kit on the left. Create a positive pressure uh, in a bag or in a vessel so that we don't have to trap people's necks in bags or plants, uh, stems in bags, and then take out air from that High, higher pressure than the atmospheric pressure uh, through uh, an absorbent um, plug and a loot off the sample, samples. And this is a trace um, from some unpublished work and some work that Ben Webster uh, repeated with Aphis Fabi, um, the black at bean aphid. And it shows a couple of compounds that relate to um, damage and that relate to repellency of the mosquito. There's a nice signal to methyl salicylate here, but a very small peak, a rather big peak from S germacrine D, but there is actually a, a peak here, which is actually the, the, uh, the, 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 the EAG deflection, but you have to use statistics to make sure you've got one there. And that's a slight problem with germacrine D. It's also a problem with germacrine D that you can't actually overexpress it in plants very easily, like we did with the germa with, with the farnesine. But already working with um, Rudy Allerman's group in Cardiff before I actually arrived, we'd managed to advance, or I'd managed to um, foist onto my chemistry colleagues at Cardiff uh, this hypothesis, basically which is that we're not really very good at making uh, viable alternatives to pheromone structures and even to some semiochemical structures by so-called QSAR uh, work. I discussed this with um, um, Emmanuel earlier on today in her lovely presentation. But what I did suggest was that if we used the last gene for the biosynthesis, um, germacrine D synthase with its magnesium uh, essential metal ions uh, in the last stage. And we started to apply non-natural precursors like we've got here with this substituted farnesyl diphosphate, which is the precursor of the cyclase that makes the germacrine D, S germacrine D. Then if it accepted the substrates as novel substrates and made them into products, those products would by definition have something of the natural space of the um, chemical space of the original olfactory ligand. And, and sure enough, the hypothesis tested true. Uh, but the compounds are actually very difficult to make and we did various mutations of the GDS synthase here uh, to, to allow more accommodation of some of these compounds that we'd got it to accept. Uh, but when we put in two methyl groups in a particular position, we reversed the activity. And there's a um, uh, uh, next one paper shows how we are now making using this wonderful synthesis approach that you see there by Rudy Allerman and Luke Johnson as first author, where we use uh, from 
files, thermophiles, vent organisms that can stand heat and organic solvents, we can actually take a kinase out of there, which is very promiscuous. So it doesn't just accept things like you would have if you use the kinase that pyrophosphorylates um, the isopropanoids to make the skeleton of the terpenoids. This, um, these uh, uh, thermophile uh, bacterial um, uh, kinases are so promiscuous that they don't just want to do what they do in the bacteria. They'll do what we want and they'll do it in organic solvents. You can't imagine such a gift. And yeah, five fact, minutes, yeah, five minutes. Yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm there. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, so. Now we've got some compounds that fulfill the testing true of my hypothesis that we could get analogs by them being accepted by the last enzyme in the biosynthesis. But then suddenly we reverse the activity and we get an attractant. Well, they press me in the journal when we published this paper on the original chemistry to say why that might be. And you can see me straining towards the idea that I want to offer to you now, which is that when the molecule is a repellent, or indeed an attractant, it has certain structural features. And if you muck about with them, if you change them in such a way that it disrupts the actual structure activity that you don't discern very readily, then it can actually even not just make an analog that does the same thing or doesn't do anything, but it can actually reverse the activity. And now we've got this new synthesis route, we can actually uh, make some other analogs here to study those, but we will need the electrophysiology. And that's of course where uh, Wen and uh, van der Gers van Nautis, and the only person who came with me when I left, uh, when I left, Card when I left Rothamsted to come to Cardiff, who is uh, Dr. Irene Castellan, and she's on the panel today. So she's uh, in, in earshot. And uh, they are now uh, on a new grant when uh, Irena's moved over into biosciences to be with Winant. There's their building. And that's the two compounds we're interested in, the natural repellent and this analog, which has now reversed the activity as being an attractant. And um, uh, before uh, we left Rothamsted, uh, Irena showed that you could do a sort of an in situ uh, a semi-field uh, push-pull with the push from the natural repellent, the germacrine D, and the attractant, now this novel compound that we've just synthesized and that I've tried to rationalize the, uh, the, 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 the science behind. Well, she uses um, the electrodes that, uh, that Wainant uses and so successfully um, of glass electrodes, uh, electrolyte filled, whereas the work that I've been talking about so far was from Lester and Christine Woodcock, Lester Wadhams and Christine Woodcock with tungsten electrodes. Uh, and that's on the uh, fifth segment of the antenna now, which is now where we expect to find the repellents and the tractants which relate to plants. And finally, the last slide then uh, that uh, Irina has produced under the guidance uh, as she trained onto this new technique for her uh, with one end that you've got, in fact, um, the, uh, the, 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 the attractant um, activity of the um, of the 1415 dimethyl germacrine attractant uh, represented here in in one sensillum where there are two co uh, expressed uh, olfactory uh, neurons, one responding to the repellent activity, one resp responding effectively to the attractant activity, but more specifically to these two compounds, though closely related giving us this differential response and wonderful uh, analogies with um, uh, cooperating co-located olfactory neurons from, from um, uh, Mario earlier on today and so on. And I leave you with the fact that we may need now to reproduce some of this work uh, in other insects if we can't get back to the aphid uh, because our grant is on mosquitoes as I said uh, but nonetheless I shall follow this through because it fits into my new chemistry work which I'm hoping to also be doing with Winant and his colleagues on the actual recognition of whole molecules uh, via the Schrodinger wave equation rather than having to pick out bits of them and try and dock them onto um, plausible but not absolutely convincing 
docking studies. That's my view anyway. Well, let's go for the wine now, but uh, I'm not sure it's going to be possible. But thanks again for listening to me and thanks again for staying until the end. I've really so much enjoyed meeting you all and hearing all the wonderful talks at this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for, for this, this wonderful talk, uh, giving us such a beautiful overview of uh, much many aspects of chemical ecology and uh, uh, the interaction between species in, in chemistry. So uh, let's see if there are any, any questions here. So uh, there's from Benjamin Sumner, uh, who is asking that could Sokoton act as an arrestant? This may be consistent with both uh, Logan's work on the white tube and McBride's work with port entry entry experiments. Yes, I mean, it's a volatile compound. We certainly find acuity in olfaction for it. Um, but uh, uh, in terms of what it does behaviorally, then obviously that depends on what it's wired up to when it leaves the peripheral uh, uh, amplification system in the in the antenna. And so it's a good question. And uh, if you've got some firm ideas on it, let's try and work out a way how it could be a tested hypothesis. OK. So uh, I, I would actually uh, like to ask a question uh, uh, that is uh, related to that, also to Sokotone, so to uh, the J work that James Logan did with you, uh, where, where you showed uh, with him that uh, uh, people that are repellent uh, produce extra chemicals, such as this Sokotone uh, that you were talking about. So I, I was wondering how is uh, uh, this repellency through producing extra compounds, how is that a, a evolutionary stable strategy? Because uh, if any the first mosquito overcomes this uh, repellency uh, and bites you, then it will realize that there is no cost to uh, to, to yes, biting and overcoming this. Right. Well, as you know, when mosquitoes uh, bite us, this represents an immense danger, uh, and they've got to get into you a whole load of chemistry as well, including uh, vasodilators and anticoagulants and so on. So they don't want really to be dealing with the wrong host. And I think it's a hypersensitivity to hosts, particularly when you've got human hosts, as Anopheles gambii sensus strictu has. Um, you, 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 you are very, very oversensitive to any kind of stress uh, on the part of the potential host. And of course, when I said that um, 6 methyl 5 heptene 2 and sulcatone and juranyl acetone are both oxidation products of, um, uh, of the, the isoprenoid pathway, in fact, we've shown an immortalized sebacite culture will convert uh, uh, squalene, in fact, uh, directly uh, to. Um, uh, to geronyl acetone, and we believe that there are other cytochromes P450 that uh, are, are, are around in that situation to convert um, the side chain of steroidal uh, hormones to the sulcatone. There's some published work, but uh, I will get it done sooner or later. Um, we, we believe that um, uh, this means that uh, they are related to the oxidative burst when you are sick or when you've been attacked or when you're jumping around so much that it, you're a danger to the mosquito. And in fact, sulcatone uh, is another contextual repellent for cows. So when you've got an ordinary heifer uh, in a herd covered in flies and you can find a cow uh, that hasn't got any flies on it, then that cow will have a higher titer in the sebum volatiles of sulcatone. Uh, and uh, we actually tried to get that developed by one of the leading veterinary companies who's also selling vaccines at the moment, though not really contributing to the science because uh, two um, refugees in Germany really invented that. So you know who I'm talking about. They actually tried it as a topical toxicant for, how, for flies on, on cattle. So they obviously didn't really understand how you would use a contextual repellent in this context. And that's part of the problem. It's quite difficult to use these things. But nonetheless, the mosquito is responding and it's hardwired olfactorily to respond respond to compounds, presumably through looking for a better host than it thinks it's got when it sees such oxidative products. Wonderful, thank you. Um, let's see, um, there are a number of uh, comments. Uh, oh, here. Um, does 
Does protection of humans that produce interfering chemicals extend over a distance? Uh, thinking about mosquitoes confronted by detection in crowds of humans. Well, you know, if you've got a cow herd uh, in the Maasai speaking community in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in East Africa in Kenya and, and Tanzania, the cow herd probably will have a doze during the uh, evening uh, while he's what, keeping a watchful eye for predators for against his cows. He'll probably have a doze and lie down on the ground. Well, Anopheles Gambia SS can fly through that herd of cows and find the human being. They, 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 they can actually choose uh, the, the, um, their host by using obviously um, various cues but the cows are let's face it are pretty hot and producing a lot of carbon dioxide and he's going for the homo sapiens species but at the same time they will make a choice based on whether that person has these um, interfering compounds so i would say the implication is that they do act at a distance but i don't know what that distance is as we all know it's actually very difficult to, uh, to work out very carefully and accurately what distance we are under um, odor, odor conditioned anemotaxis. And uh, I mean, you know, it's something we crucially need to know. And I'm so pleased that there are great people working in that area. Okay, thank you. Um, then uh, uh, Ganesh uh, Galthakar is asking what kind of difference is there in the SSR response for attractancy and repellency will be the same as mentioned in the last slide. Uh, well, if, uh, from, a, from a man who really only sees peripheral uh, uh, single cell recordings, I mean, they look pretty much the same to me. I, I mean, Christine used to have a bit of show business in which she would put an electrode into an aphid's antenna and place the electrode between two olfactory neurons in one uh, in one sensillum. And one neuron was firing to a repellent, one neuron was firing to an attractant. And uh, if you could get a, a visitor from the Ministry of Agriculture who could understand that much, then they would be very impressed that you could do that. So th they, they look the same, but obviously they are wired differently. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I greatly applaud the, the, the people who are trying to move into aphids like uh, um, uh, Sylvia Anton and so on, because there's some great examples here where we could look at that in that context. But now we've got the mosquito uh, in our uh, in, in our labs uh, in uh, in Cardiff, big time. Then uh, we'll obviously be looking wherever we need to uh, to uh, build better attractiveness, uh, which is our brief. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Are there any more questions here? Is Marcus raising his hand or is he just scratching his head? I was scratching my head. So. <laughs> oh, so, okay. I thought maybe you got a glass of schnapps there that we could enjoy. No, 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 not yet. <laughs> Good talk, John. I, I mean, you covered it all. No questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for the, for, for the talk and for the, for the many questions here. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I think uh, it's a... I would like to first uh, thank my co-hosts, co uh, Coral, and especially, of course, Walter Leal, uh, but also uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Jacquin uh, Jolie, who joined me today in uh, introducing and moderating the questions, and uh, Irene Castellan, uh, who uh, uh, helped in the, in the, in the background, um, and of course, especially the speakers of today, and uh, also uh, the audience for asking the questions and uh, being such, uh, such good discussants, uh, such a, giving such a good discussion. So uh, with this, I would like to actually hand uh, back over to uh, Walter Leal, who I see uh, has, is, uh, is there. And uh, uh, Walter, may I hand back over for you for closing remarks, please? What a wonderful journey. Unbelievable. We made it in 24 hours. Uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable meeting. Uh, when we came out with this idea of 24 hours, uh, First thing I did, it was call Winan and say, Winan, I have a crazy idea here and I need someone with sanity uh, to tell me whether I'm wrong or not. And then Winan said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> so we started working together. And then second thing was that, wait, 
that Zoom allow us to, have to run a meeting for 24 hours. So it was the next technical question. And from there, we had many other technical questions. <laughs> it was a gratifying experience to see many young scholars taking the opportunity to participate here. Uh, John mentioned that the, uh, the heroes are the, the speakers. I agree with that. But also those who participate as attendees, not only here uh, directly on Zoom, but also on YouTube. Right now, we have 35 people uh, still watch on YouTube. And many of us, one did not want to be seen on camera. We're watching on YouTube on our pajamas or late in the night, and they follow this meeting for 24 hours. One of these attendees, very engaged, uh, was Greg Pask. Greg, may I call you in here and ask your impression about the meeting? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Walter, and thanks to everybody for for speaking to the, uh, today in the last 24 hours. I don't know who stayed up for the entire 24 hours, but you probably are highly caffeinated and probably are used, you know, ready for the schnapps. Um, but yeah, it, it was a great meeting. It was really fantastic for me to connect with um, with collaborators, people who used to be in the same lab space as me um, uh, in in my journey in in cycle faction and. Um, I also it was really cool to have this on in the lab with a bunch of my undergraduate students who, while we were hearing about all the cool science, I was kind of connecting how this relates to what we're currently doing, which was really great. And also there was the sound of some um, single and film recording spikes in the background, which is always just a great harmony uh, to have. So thank you to, to Walter, to Wynn and to Coral for manning this and all the all the speakers for this. And I, I hope this continues in the future. Thank you very much, Greg. It was glad, I'm glad to have you there uh, participating in the asking questions and interacting with us. Thank you so very much. Uh, I ask also uh, Leslie Vossal if she could come here back and talk in the name of all speakers and they give a message to all of us at the, the closing of this event. Leslie. Walter, thank you. Uh, this was such an audacious, ambitious idea, crazy, manic, but incredibly successful. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. Worked incredibly well. And uh, I only stayed up for 11 hours, so I was a little bit of a coward. I just did 11 of the hours. But what I was able to sample was extraordinary. So much unpublished work um, and many historical perspectives of the origins of the field. So I think that that was an important so that we don't remember the past, that we don't forget the past when we are thinking about the future experiments. Um, and I think that the most inspiring thing of the last 24 hours was the many young students and postdocs who took the stage and took the floor. Um, it's kind of scary to give a talk to uh, several hundred people online. And, and so those were among the best talks was the, uh, the students and postdocs. So again, Walter, Vinant and Coral, thank you uh, for an incredible experience. I do hope that we will have a CETO again uh, in Sardinia so we can all um, sit on our lawn chairs uh, and go, go swimming in the Mediterranean, but we won't be able to have a thousand people at, at the resort. So, so this was in some way greater impact and more important than any in-person meeting I've ever been to. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Leslie. And as Leslie mentioned, the students uh, are, are very courageous to come here and present. And the many students were there attending also. And I see here in the list of uh, students attending, uh, just fresh PhD students. I don't know if uh, she already got the degree. Natalia Brito. Natalia, are you there? Hi. So what's your impression about the meeting? Well, the meeting was actually wonderful for me and very different from any meeting I have attended before. I think the idea of the 24-hour um, talks was incredible as you said um i'm i'm just beginning my postdoctorate and it's incredible to be able to listen to so many authors that i uh read all their papers in order to get where i where i am and um and everybody in one place so i guess uh, the pandemic has a silver lining and I think the initiative uh, from uh, Professor Walter Leal uh, was incredible, and we should try to do this more often. 
thank thank you very much natalia uh, finally someone pronounced my name properly uh, <laughs> thank you so very much for for your participation it was a wonderful meeting natalia said very well uh, there is a silver line for, for for this pandemic that was this opportunity for us to get together all of you guys in the same place for 24 hours uh, i would like you to to mention here in closing the uh, the people who helped the eyes uh, to have this event together. Uh, we had obviously uh, Winan uh, and the Coral uh, that worked together as a co-host. And as I mentioned before, Coral was moving from one university to another uh, uh, within two weeks. And she uh, had to manage uh, moving of the family as well as organization of this event. And in the middle of another lockdown, in the part uh, of Australia where she is. Uh, there are lots of people that help us, these illustrations, the logo, uh, everyone that involves in that in a, some way. We have these ideas and they bring to people and they execute the year. Like uh, the illustration was done by Robbie Riddle and Steve Dana from the Information and Educational Technology here at UC Davis. We we'll always get the word out. This time we focus on Twitter as the mean, the main mean of advertising this event. Uh, but also we put the word out, uh, and Kathy Gavi, the communication specialist here at UC Davis, uh, it's always fantastic. She writes the stories and send it to the local newspapers, put it on, on blogs, and all of this together help advertise the event and bring so many people together. Again, uh, on the three segments in the PDT segment, uh, we have uh, Karen Menus uh, that help us from UCCon, uh, Kelly Brand and Efrain Vasquez, uh, the undergraduate students here uh, at UC Davis that help with the chat and the, uh, the questions and the time and so on and so forth. And then we move to the next segment of the AEST uh, where Cora War was our co-host and together uh, with Wei Zhu, she moderated the event. Mackenzie Love, Love Group uh, helped there with the time uh, and the other logistic details. And finally, we're coming now uh, to BST with Winand and Emmanuel, uh, that were the co-moderators, and Arini Castellano uh, that helped in the background uh, working uh, uh, with all the details. So it's wonderful to have here uh, what John Hildebrand called the global exito. So no doubt that this was the modern of exito. Uh, two things that we could not offer, the beach of Sardinia and the, the nice food of the Italian food that is always served at exito meetings. So there is pros and cons of the meeting person and the meet online. We did our best to make this uh, not so heavily structured, but the formally structured in a way that to be uh, uh, professional enough to showcase our field for the incredible number of people that attend and will uh, watch the video. Because now the video is going to be available. I'm going to edit the video. I edited many videos on YouTube, but I never edited one of 24 hours. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but in some way we're going to trim the video and make available to all attendees. Thank you everyone for your participation. Thank the speakers, uh, the attendees, uh, the organizers, and everyone to work together uh, to, complete, to complete this mission of 24 hours that right now is exactly 24 hours of the meeting. And we have it to finish, otherwise Zoom might cut the ice as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay well.